Welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and I'm a found footage fool. Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of uh, Found Footage Full here on The Dark Parade. Uh, as I said in the upfront, my name is Bo. I'm your guide in this world of footage we call found. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, welcome back. This will be a little bit longer an episode, uh, in theory, than uh, the last couple of Found Footage Fools. But So, here's the premise. I always like, always like a, you know, some kind of idea behind the show. And the idea is I ran across a top 10 list from, I think it was Dread Central, pretty sure, uh, that was like, hey, here are the, the top 10 found footage movies of 2022, and I'm a sucker for that kind of list, and also a sucker for found footage movies, obviously. So I was like, all right, let's play a little catch up. And uh, so I watched uh, some of the movies we had talked uh, about before, uh, Deadstream, I think we've talked about, if not... Um, I was a little cooler on that movie than uh, De uh, Dread Central seemed. Um, there was uh, 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 what, what was the more recent comedy one? Maybe that is Deadstream, and I'm thinking of something else. Um, but regardless, there were a, a lot of movies on that list, ten of them to be precise, and most of them I'd seen, and many of them we talked about before, but there were a handful that we hadn't. And uh, so I thought, well, let's use this as an opportunity to talk about some found footage movies and, and really uh, inspired me just to sit down and watch a, a handful that I'd heard about and hadn't watched. So uh, without further ado, let's just get to it. And um, the first one I want to talk about is maybe the weirdest on the list. Uh, uh, anyway, it's called The Curse of Professor Zardonicus. And the, the premise of the movie is this. There's a, a guy who is a college student and decides he's going to make a documentary about this weirdo on campus who believes that uh, there was a professor named Professor Zardonicus that uh, like uh, one of his students basically <laughs> performed a practical joke and turned him into this hideous monster. And this guy says, like, I saw it. I was attacked by Professor Zardonicus. And what follows is the documentary that this college student is making about all of this. And it becomes less about whether or not there is a monster loose on campus than it is, you know, you have this, this character that um, is trying to find his way in the world he's you know he's just a weirdo and the question is like you know does this belief in professor zardonicus it, it strangely becomes sort of his identity and you know so how does that how does that manifest and and is it ultimately dangerous and uh, so it, it, it's an interesting take on uh, the, the kind of found footage movie where you're trying to do something a little deeper with the characters and a little different with the characters. And probably worth saying up front, like all of these movies that I'm going to talk about today are super low budget. Um, these are almost all um, movies that uh, are... are you know, I would say, I mean, a million dollars seems like a stretch for any of them. I would say that, you know, tens of thousands of dollars is probably more uh, appropriate to what the budget of these movies are. Um, and I think all of them are pretty successful in using that budget to, to the best of their ability. And, and like, for example, this movie we're talking about, The Curse of Professor Zardonicus, doesn't feel cynical in any way. It, it does feel like a legitimately trying to capture something about these characters and you know the filmmaker um is in a relationship with his girlfriend and that is a little strained by his you know association 
with uh, this guy Darren, and um, he, like he he kind of loses himself. Greg is the name of the the filmmaker, and Greg kind of loses himself in the making of this, and becomes a, a you know obsessed with uh, with Darren and and his worldview. And meanwhile, Darren's doing crazy shit like you know questioning the the wacko on campus who's spouting about. Um, you know, the end of the world and the apocalypse from a religious point of view and trying to uh, make a connection with this guy because he's saying like, hey, we don't believe in the same thing, but we're both people who intensely believe in something. And doesn't that make us kind of the same? And at one point, Greg kind of pretends to see Professor Zardonicus at one point and Darren really latches onto that and, and believes that, you know, Greg is kind of uh, a brother in arms uh, trying to find, you know, this creature living somewhere on or near the college campus. And so all of that stuff is interesting. And, and when you get to the end of the movie, uh, you know, it really kind of begs the question of, you know, do, if you believe in something enough, can you manifest it? And if you can't manifest it, is there a way to to sort of become the thing? And it, it like it, I don't I don't want to get any deeper into that, but but it's interesting. It's got an interesting turn at the end, um, and I like the fact that the movie was so much about the characters and so much about this you know very lonely weirdo just trying to make a connection. And um, anyway. But we're not talking about the subjective experience of watching the movie. We have science to do. So let's talk about science. Uh, and here are our five criteria, and we'll evaluate the curse of Pro- Professor Zardonicus based on this. Um, one is keeping the camera on. Does it make sense in the movie for the camera to have remained on? And obviously in a documentary, this kind of mockumentary style film, um, which a, a couple of these are, then, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense because the whole point is you're capturing the story of this weirdo. And uh, so, 100%, keeping the camera on, totally fine. Then you get to characters. And as I said, the, the characters are really what makes this movie as interesting as it is. Um, a, a guy named Alec White plays Darren, and then there's Gabriel Theus who plays Greg, uh, who also wrote and directed the movie, and I think went on to work for Dread Central. And he's, uh, you know, like, the characters are are solid, you know? Um, Greg is is a little obsessive. Darren, obviously, is, you know, like I said, he's, he's sympathetic to a point, but also he does stuff like you know going to an lgbt poetry slam and trying to recruit people into believing his story of being attacked by professor zardonicus and what you realize is that like he sees all the these groups that have their own identity and his identity like the thing that defines him is this moment you know this is the thing that makes him special and interesting and and worth talking to and talking about and uh you know the the sad fact is most of us have that period in our lives where we try to figure out like who we are who do we who do we define ourselves by or what do we define ourselves by and that's kind of the the thing about curse of professor zardonicus that's most interesting is that the story isn't really about professor zardonicus the story is very much about darren and him struggling to find his identity and you know when when he talks about the lgbt poetry slam and busting in and interrupting the proceedings by, you know, having this spiel about Zardonicus and getting kind of pissed off when they, they you know, boo him off the stage and, and shout him out of the place. And you, as a viewer, you're like, you know, this guy's kind of an asshole. But you, t- you take two seconds and think about the larger theme of the movie and realize, like, oh, he just saw them as people who had a very 
um, uh, like identifiable uh, sort of ethos and identity that they could call their own. And that's what he's trying to latch on to. Like, you know, whether it's the wacko religious, religious zealot or the LGBT poetry slam, these are all people who believe in something and or or have something about themselves that is is a source of their identity and he doesn't have that and the only thing he's got is professor zardonicus and is trying to find some kind of relationship with people that might feel the same way even if it's not about the same thing and so that that part of it's really interesting that the, the characters are are very good you know there's a little bit again these are super low budget movies and and so Almost all of them are going to have the caveat of sometimes, you know, these are not in most cases professional actors. And there are moments where, you know, especially one scene set at a radio station where the DJ in particular, you're like, all right, you're not maybe the best actor in the world. And I don't mean to, uh, to poop on this guy, uh, who's, who's playing the DJ, but also, you know, it takes you out of the movie a little bit, and and there are those moments for sure. Um, then you get to authenticity, and I think that's where the movie really kind of sings, because it does feel authentic in that, you know, it, you're, you're basically following a weirdo, and there are plenty of weirdos out there. There are plenty of weirdos to be had, and the fact that this weirdo is um like uh, uh, you know the the focus of a, a film or a documentary is kind of what makes it interesting and when you get to the end of the movie um I, you know i think that really is, is where the the theme is sold when greg is kind of being interviewed about the disappearance of darren and anyway it's it's quite interesting and I think that it feels like an amateur documentary, you know, and, and the stuff that you're capturing, especially the stuff with uh, Darren and or not Darren, but Greg and his girlfriend, Rachel, there are some arguments that they have uh, sort of on camera as he's, you know, recording some talking head footage of himself or doing some narration. And she's like, hey, are you going to this party with me? Um, and he's like, no, I'm not going because at first you criticize the fact that I don't do much at all. And now you're criticizing me for working too much. And you can kind of see this like decay of their relationship as, as it goes. And the fact that it is largely, uh, fueled by Greg's, you know, obsession and whims and that he's still kind of a, a kid, but also that his identity is, I am a filmmaker. I am. A, I'm a documentarian, and so much of the movie is, you know, about identity and the the fact that Greg has his own identity that he he's adhering to at the cost of a relationship. You know, uh, this is who he is, according to his own, you know, his, his own view of himself. So, anyway, very interesting. And then uh, we get to watchability. Is the movie very watchable? And that's where I've got to ding it a little bit because it's good. No question about it. Uh, I like Curse of Professor Zardonicus, but there are times when it kind of drags. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's a little overlong. And one of the worst things that you can run into with um, a found footage movie is when it doesn't know when to get out. And I think the end of this is nice and tight, but it's got a little bit of a saggy middle. And, you know, for a, a found footage movie to ulti ultimately be a character study, which is what this is, it needs to feel just a, a hair bit snappier. And it's not a giant criticism, because at the end of the day, I still had a good time with it, and I'm glad I saw it, and there are good things about it. You know, on the, on the scale of found footage movies this is more ambitious in a lot of ways than a lot of these movies are. So uh, I almost recommend it solely on that. The fact that it's trying to do something a little more thoughtful with the form, uh, as opposed to just do another, here are a bunch of kids in a haunted asylum and Oh, Oh boy, ghosts are coming for them. Uh, it's doing more than that. And so I, I like it for that reason. But 
you know, watchability. Yeah, it it does drag a little bit, but the beginning is really solid. The end is really solid. If there were about five, ten minutes tightened up in the middle, I, I think it would be uh, a, a much more full-throated recommendation. Uh, but it's it's fine uh, in, in terms of the watchability argument, just not as good as some of the others we'll talk about on the list. So, uh, And then our final criteria for this is scares. And that's the thing. This movie is not scary. And and I don't think it's intended to be. It uses horror trappings. I mean, the, this crazy sci-fi story of this professor turned into a monster by a student's experiment and now living somewhere, you know, around the university and appearing to terrorize students and that kind of thing. But that's, you know, that is the MacGuffin of the movie, but it is not what the movie is about. And so I don't think that you're going to find that Professor Zardonicus is setting out to scare you at all. But it's interesting. And I, I again, I like it for its ambition. It's, it's a more ambitious movie than a lot of the movies that we talk about on, on Found Footage Fool. Uh, some of them are wildly ambitious and exceed their grasp. And this is one that manages to mostly get it right and do something a little more subtle and a, and a little more interesting than your your average found footage movie. So, um, yeah, so Pro- Curse of Professor Zardonicus, uh, check it out. Uh, I think it's on Tubi is where I watched it. So if you can handle a few ads in your found footage, um, and maybe that is also not helping that kind of saggy middle. Um, at any rate. So let's move on to uh, to our next movie. And the next movie I want to talk about is the Andy Baker tape, uh, which is uh, a, a found footage movie about a guy named uh, Andy Baker, as the title might suggest, who is the half brother of a YouTube celebrity. This YouTube celebrity is uh, a guy uh, named Jeff. Uh, Jeff Blake is his name. And he's a dude who has a YouTube channel um, all about, you know, going to different food holes, evaluating the food, that kind of thing. And he is getting close to a deal in which he is going to uh, potentially get a gig at the Food Network or the Food Channel, whatever they call it. And while he's uh, working on that, he stops... uh, off on his journey or begins his journey by visiting this guy, Andy Baker, who is uh, his half brother that he has discovered because, uh, you know, after his father's death, he wants to connect with other relatives and discovers this half brother out there. And so um, the story is really the two of them taking a road trip as Jeff is putting together footage for uh, a, a, a pilot for this show that's going to be on the Food Network and his half brother comes along for the ride ostensibly because he's got a gig in near Boston and so is going to um, you know tag along and basically carpool with him and that gig then falls apart and he ends up becoming sort of part of the show right it, you know he becomes like the sidekick and stopping at all these roadside restaurants and um you know tasting the food and as the the film goes on you know he starts to kind of creepily film his brother uh jeff you know getting in the shower and brushing his teeth and sleeping and that kind of thing and and lets you know like hey something is going on with andy baker um something is not quite right with this guy and uh, so again, let us apply our science and see if this movie is, is worth your time. Um, so because it is a, Hey, we're filming a pilot and also Andy periodically just picks up the camera and, you know, to films, Jeff doing weird shit or normal stuff, but it, weirdly filming him at, you know, sort of personal and inopportune moments. Um, the keeping the camera stuff on is great. And in fact, in true found footage full fashion, 
this is the only film I think that is actually found footage in the sense that the movie begins with like, hey, there was this 911 call and then we found a camera with these SD cards. And so here's what was on that those cards. So this is truly found footage. And uh, so keeping the camera on makes perfect sense. Um, the characters of Jeff Blake and Andy Baker are, again, uh, you know, kind of what sells this movie. Um, the Brett Latta is the guy playing Jeff, and he's really good. Like, he, he plays kind of an asshole, but he's good at it. And then you have Dustin Fontaine, who, you know, both of these guys have done a little bit of work. You know, and I, I would imagine they'll probably get a little more work uh, based on this movie because I think they're both pretty good. And um, we're saying it's uh, directed by uh, Brett Latta and written by the two stars. So um, it, it's a successful examination of these two guys. You know, um, Andy Baker at first seems much more simple, a little not slow exactly just you know he's just a normal dude and wh whereas uh jeff is trying to be a youtube per youtube personality he's he's a little more self-assured he's a you know certainly narcissistic to some degree and has had this relationship with their father that the other one did not have like andy didn't didn't know the father real well and, um, you know, that's a, kind of a point of strain. And there, there are moments when, you know, Andy is asking about him and asking, like, you know, did he ever hit you or anything? Because you seem like you get angry real fast. And I know that happens in abusive relationships. And, um, you know, so there's this, like, growing strain between them uh, as the movie goes on. And, and also, you know, you as a viewer are starting to realize, like, maybe things aren't totally on the up and up with Andy Baker. And by the time you get to the end of the movie, things are very much not on the up and up with, with Andy Baker, uh, unsurprisingly, because it is called the Andy Baker tape. Uh, but I, I won't spoil the, the exact what. Um, all right, so let's go to authenticity. Is, is the movie authentic? Does it feel authentic? And yeah, I don't watch a lot of those YouTube videos of people like going to, you know, hole in the wall restaurants and eating. Uh, that's not my thing, but I get it. And I think this is a pretty good representation of that, um, where you see, uh, you know, this guy, Jeff, trying to wrestle with this half brother that he's a little low key pissed at all the time for tagging along and also just snapping at him all the time. Like he, he's just yeah, the way he puts it is like, I'm under a lot of pressure, but the real, the reality of it is, is that he's, he's exacting. He's used to working alone and doesn't have a lot of time to teach his, his half brother. Here's what I need you to do. He just, brings him along for the ride and when when Andy Baker fucks up he yells at him about it and is just kind of a jerk you know like there are moments where you understand like yeah he really is trying to connect with with Andy but also you know he is trying to get this TV show and that is ultimately his priority and kind of tells Andy Baker that like you know tells him like I need I this is what I've been working for and and this is what I care about and originally tells him not to come along on this trip and then you know sort of one thing leads to another but um is is definitely kind of an asshole and as a viewer you're like oh you are gonna get it dude uh Andy Baker is only gonna take so much more of this before he goes fully crazy um and so, yes, but it feels authentic. I think the performances are good enough that you honestly feel like this could have been a YouTube series. Uh, I didn't feel that the performances were too theatrical at any point. You know, again, the, the, there are moments for sure 
where I feel like, eh, this is not maybe the most realistic portrayal, but uh, for a movie that was made on the cheap by the, you know, director and writers of the movie, um, it is more successful than not. And so then we get to watchability, and I found this movie very watchable. I think both the characters are fun. Um, the movie mostly keeps things escalating. I never found myself getting uh, too bored. I, I didn't have that sagging feeling like I did with uh, Curse of Professor Zardonicus, which uh, felt uh, just a hair over long, and I didn't feel that with this. And, I, you know, it's a shorter movie, I think. Uh, Andy Baker tape is about an hour 20, something like that. So it definitely felt uh, snappier. And uh, so, yeah, it was very watchable. I enjoyed my time with it. And then we come to scares. Is it scary? And I think it's got moments of, of creepiness. There are certainly things about it that I find um, compelling I don't know that I was ever scared, and and my big complaint with the movie, and it's one I've seen repeated by some others who have seen the film, and I, I think this is right. My big complaint with the movie is by the time you get to, oh, Andy really isn't right, and in the head, I mean, and uh, is about to do something really drastic... By the time you get to that, it kind of happens real fast, and then the movie's out. And it feels like you needed to spend a little more time where the movie found a, that final gear, where it got really harrowing. Um, and there were some revelations in there, some story revelations that you learn about Andy, which are good. But again, it just needs to spend a, a little more time in that place where Andy's fully wackadoodle. And terrorizing Jeff and and letting us know, like, this is why Jeff deserves this. And I think that's a missed opportunity. It's it's not bad. The Andy Baker tape is not a bad movie. But just when you think it's going to get really good, it it kind of ends. And I think that's a real bummer. So, uh, you know, where Curse of Zardonicus of Professor Zardonicus doesn't go for scares and instead is a much more uh, compelling kind of character study thing. Um, this movie does. The Andy Baker tape is definitely going for something disturbing and a little scarier and doesn't quite get there because it just, it, like, like it, it, you know, the fireworks go off too early and um, and they're not long enough, you know? It's like, uh, a 4th of July extravaganza with only one really good pyrotechnic. And then it's like, all right, well, see everybody next year. And you're like, that was it? That was all we got? I'd have waited in line for an hour to see this thing. And and that's the, I think that analogy is kind of right because that's how it felt. Like I was waiting an hour for something to happen. And then when it happens, it's, it's a bottle rocket and not the big mortar shell of fireworks that I wanted. So yeah, a little bit of a bummer with the Andy Baker tape, but it's good. Like, uh, you know, the journey to get to the ending is so good that it made it especially frustrating when you get to the end of the movie and it, and it just kind of fizzles out because the rest of it was so good. Uh, and you know, there's nothing, <laughs> There's nothing worse than a movie that gets to the finish line and, and kind of fumbles. And that's what Andy Baker tape kind of feels like. It, it feels like it, it stumbles at the end. Um, okay, so let's talk about the last film on our list, which is uh, Holes in the Sky, the Sean Miller story. And this is uh, written and directed by Ash Hamilton. Uh, co-written with Andrew J. Peevler. Uh Ash Hamilton is um, a, a director uh, of this and a, a short called Play With Me and has worked on some other movies. And uh, I think he is uh, like um, maybe Horror Fix is the name of it. Like I think he actually is 
running a, an honest to goodness horror website. And not that I know anything about that, but let me see if that's a, a real thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Horror Fix is a real thing, and I think he actually runs that. And uh, so, anyway, let's talk not just about Ash Hamilton, who runs a horror website and and has made this movie, but about the movie itself, Holes in the Sky, the Sean Miller story. And um, I'm just going to say right from jump, I am real down with this movie. This is kind of the perfect storm of shit I like. And so I, I'm going to give you the caveat of your mileage may vary, but I really like this. Um, the premise of the movie is there. there is this guy and Sean Miller, like Ash Hamilton and his wife Chanel... Uh, are running this horror website. He's, you know, making movies on the side. And he hears about this guy named Sean Miller who had this alien abduction something or other. And it was nearby. It was local to him somewhere in Illinois. And he wants to find out more about it. Like, it happened a few years before. And he's like, you know... And then it just became very difficult to get information about it. And so... You know, he takes to Reddit and and that kind of thing. And uh, ends up meeting uh, somebody through Reddit that's like, hey, here's an article about this story. And also, uh, not for nothing, but I know uh, Andy Miller. and Or I've, I've got his email address and here it is. And so, um, Andy Miller, uh, not Andy Miller, Sean Miller... Um, confusing this with the Andy Baker tape. So Sean Miller um, agrees to talk to him and says, look, I'm going to give you five minutes. And if at the end of this five minutes, um, you know, this isn't working, then please respect that. And so they have this initial meeting. And then uh, Sean Miller agrees, like, you can come hang out for five days, film your documentary, and then you got to go. And, um, so that that's what happens. The, this is the story of those five days. And it's done in a weird kind of documentary about a documentary style where the documentary that Ash uh, Hamilton, did I forget? Yeah, Ash Hamilton. Um, the, the, the documentary he films is not the documentary you're watching. There's an, another documentary because of what happened when they went to film this that is sort of the wraparound story where... Um, another documentary film crew is interviewing Ash Hamilton, his wife, Sean's wife, and uh, asking them, like, okay, so what happened? And um, I like the fact that it it, it is this sort of like, hey, we're going to tell the story of the story you were trying to tell and that you became part of. And... It, like the premise of it isn't the uh, the most original in the sense that like hey we're gonna go um, talk to this dude who's been abducted and things are going weird things are gonna happen like there there have been all those Phoenix incident and Phoenix forgotten and you know there are plenty of alien alien abduction by the way uh, a movie all all to itself. Uh, a lot of found footage examples of, you know, alien abduction stories, alien attack stories, that kind of thing. What I like, though, is this mockumentary style presentation of it. And I like those movies. I'm kind of a sucker for them. And so you couple that with this mockumentary style, as well as um, some pretty good performances out of all of the leads. I would say the shakiest is maybe... Sean himself, a guy named Sean Ed, who uh, plays Sean Miller. And, I, you know, this is his only credited role. So, uh, but he's pretty good. Like the the performances in general are, are generally very good. So I, you know, again, I'm kind of picking nits with certain scenes like, ah, eh, this was a little unbelievable here. It's a little unbelievable here. Um, but the thing that I like about it is that it gets nuts 
and it, but but peppered in along the way like weird stuff starts to happen almost immediately and that escalates and then it just becomes chaos at the end and that to me is the perfect formula for a found footage movie where you start with like okay this is a little weird oh that's a lot weird and then you know here's the big slam bang ending and it's framed on both sides by this 911 call on the final night of filming where uh, it starts with Sean's wife and then it turns into Chanel, uh, Ash's wife, the documentarian, both on the phone with 911 talking about how there are people outside surrounding the house and they need help right away. And so you know where we're headed and then you get there and I found it to be satisfying. So uh, of the three, this is my favorite. You'll probably hear that as we're talking about it. But let us apply science and, and don't take my word for it. Take science's word for it. So uh, one, keeping the camera on, does it make sense? And absolutely, it absolutely makes sense to keep the camera on on account of the fact that, again, this is a mockumentary. And so not only do you have the footage that they're recording, but you have... Uh, this wraparound documentary where you're interviewing the principals like Ash Hamilton and Chanel and, and Sean's wife about, hey, here, you know, what happened? What was going on at this time? What was your emotional state, et cetera? So I, I thought all that was great. Um, keeping the camera on, 100%. Characters. Uh, I really like it. I like the fact that, you know, Ash Hamilton, um, I, it seems like a good dude, first of all. But I like the fact that Ash Hamilton is initially very excited and then pretty quickly, as soon as he meets Sean and weird shit starts happening, he, he talks about how you kind of go from we were making this for entertainment value to here is this guy living with something and he's trying to live a normal life, but he can't because of the weird shit happening around him all the time. And Sean does seem very haunted at times by the world around him. Um, the weakest character, uh, which is one of the m more compelling, is this guy named uh, Brett. And Brett is their cameraman and, you know, is a buddy of, of Ash's and is the guy that he, apparently... You, you don't know exactly why at first, but, like, his marriage was breaking up and, you know, Ash tells him up front, like, hey, you don't have to do this. You don't have to come on this one. And he's like, no, 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 of course. Like, what else would I do? And then as time goes on, you realize, like, oh, that was probably, that was probably a bad idea. You probably shouldn't have. You, you probably shouldn't have come. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, his, his performance, I think, is the weakest overall. Um, he's not in it a ton, but he does figure prominently into the end of the movie. And I think that that's one of the bigger flaws of the film in a movie that I really like. Uh, so Brett is not the most compelling of characters, but what are you going to do? So then, um, let, let's talk about authenticity. Does it feel authentic? And maybe that's also a flaw but not in a bad way it it does feel it has almost like that lake mungo kind of vibe of this is a, a, a typical you know paranormal documentary and their twists and turns and um but there are certain moments that don't feel completely real some of them do there's one bit in particular where uh they want to get some footage from Sean and they, he doesn't want to give it to him. He's like, I didn't really catch anything. And then his wife, when he, you know, Sean goes to take a shower or something and his wife gets his phone and hands it to him and gives him the code and they pull up his footage and watch it. And it's him seeing, um, his father and chasing after him out into the woods. And that, and it's, real hazy and it you know uh even ash and his wife are like well we can't really use this footage because he can't really see anything but he believes it sean believes he saw his father who has been dead for some time and later on talks uh sean talks about how 
oh yeah, I, like you see people, wh- whatever these things are that are are after him, these these alien creatures will assume the forms of people that he cares about so that he's more comfortable, but he understands that they're, they're not really those people at a certain point. And that stuff feels very authentic. There's another scene though, where Sean's brother-in-law sees a figure out in the field, goes out to confront it and then has a freak out. And that freak out is a little shaky in terms of the acting, but the the thing, and I'll get to the scares in a minute, but the thing I like about it is that uh, some of what happens in the movie is a little bit inscrutable uh, in the sense that you don't 100% understand what the motive of the the villains of the film are, of these creatures. And there's something I like about that. Um, so authenticity, a little shaky, but even when it, it veers away from feeling completely authentic, it still manages to be an entertaining movie. Which brings us to watchability, and I would watch this movie again right now, um, and might. Uh, I think this was on maybe Freebie or something like that. Like it was hard to find a a, a streaming version of it. Um, I think I found it through Amazon Prime, and yeah, I think it was Freebie is the service that that hosted it, which is a shame that it's it, it's kind of hidden and and hard to find. Um, because it's quite good. Um, I found it not just kind of watchable. Uh, oh, it's also on Tubi. So yeah, if, if you've got Tubi, uh, check it out there. Holes in the Sky, the Sean Miller story. Um, it, it, I found it super entertaining. It, it's not terribly long as good found footage tends to be. Uh, not terribly long. And about an hour 30, maybe a little over that, but I, it doesn't really sag for me. And, um, it, you know, like I said, maybe I'm just a sucker for this kind of thing, but every time I think the movie is going to, uh, start to slow down, they'll bring in something like, Oh, we're going to have this person show up who is, uh, who does hip- hypnotic regressions for, um, alien abductees and let's let's see what that looks like with Sean and of course you know that leads to something that that's kind of squirrely and then something's going on with Brett and oh by the way here are these you know things that we're seeing somewhere out in this field and you know there's enough along the way to get you to the finish line you know like again much like uh, the Andy Baker tape you're being kind of pulled along by the events of the film. Unlike the Andy Baker tape, when you get to the ending, that's when shit really pops off. And, uh, and let's, let's talk about the scares. Cause I genuinely found this movie kind of scary. Um, you know, not necessarily asleep with the lights on, but there are some really striking images. And I, the thing that I really loved about it is that, the movie doesn't ever completely explain the purpose of these abductions. All you need to know is this guy is being haunted by these aliens or beings or whatever. Are they UFOs? Is it extra dimensional? I mean, the implication is that it's probably UFOs. Um, But whatever it is, it's been with him since he was a kid and is just getting worse and like the whole reason that they're you know talking to this guy is because years before he disappeared for three or four days and then showed back up and doesn't have a clear memory of what happened which you know is why they they try to do the hypnotic regression but you know uh, it's weird shit surrounds him constantly it's hard to film him because batteries keep draining or the video fucks up that there's a sense that there are things constantly around watching him. And even early on in the movie, there's a moment of, Hey, we're getting these knocks at the door, both front and back. And when they go around to try to catch whoever it is, you see a something, you know, running away from the door. And that kind of stuff is, you know, like it, it just builds the creep factor kind of builds and builds and builds until you get to the end of the movie where, you know, it 
it doesn't show you everything. Um, in particular, there's one bit where they're like, oh, Sean's wife tried to grab the door as these creatures were surrounding the house and it threw her back. And you don't ever really see that, but a, a couple of the characters talk about it on the 911 call. And that's kind of fine. I, I, it, I noted it. You know, it was one of those things of like, oh, yeah, that, that'd be tough to show on this budget. But um, there are a couple of moments where it really goes for it. And I think when it goes for it, it mostly succeeds. And and I find Ash Hamilton to be a really interesting and compelling character to talk about this. And he has to hit like an emotional beat at the end of this and kind of nails it. So um, I really like it and and found it to be dread inducing. There's something to me about the idea of being haunted by aliens all your life. Like Dark Skies, I, I also find... Uh, disturbing for this reason of like you can't fight it because it's it's beyond your comprehension it's just going to happen to you there's nothing you can really do about it and you just have to learn to live with it sort of and at the end of the day if they just decide they're going to come pluck you out of existence and you're just gone then so be it um and and you know there is some of that in this movie and i find that really frightening I, you know, even though I said that it, it feels inauthentic, the thing in the field I find really fascinating because, again, the movie doesn't go out of its way to explain this is what this thing was and what it was doing there. You just know that it was watching Sean and the rest of them, and then something happens. And you can't really explain that something other than to say, here's the effects of that something, but I don't know what the alien did. Uh, if it, in fact, was an alien or uh, interdimensional being or whatever the fuck. And uh, so I really like all that stuff. I think it really works well. Um, when I turned the movie off, it was dark in the house, and I felt a little creeped out by that. You know, I was like, oh, I don't think aliens are coming for me or nothing. But it did make me, like, want to turn on a light. And, and there is no better compliment I can give to a horror film than to say it made me want to turn on the lights I was a little creeped out so I anyway I thought Holes in the Sky the Sean Miller story it's not without its flaws it's super low budget some of the effects work is a little dodgy some of the acting is a little dodgy but of the three movies that I watched I thought it was the most successful it was the most fun it was the creepiest um, and it's the one that like I can full throatedly recommend to people who like found footage movies. Like a hundred percent, go watch Holes in the Sky. It's uh, a, a really interesting take on that. Or, or it could just be that that's the kind of thing that I get off on. Uh, this kind of movie, the alien abduction stuff, it does hit me the right way. And so perhaps uh, that is why I like the movie as much as I do. But I, I found it to be. Uh, quite good um okay well that's good that's it that's our trio of movies for this episode of found footage full uh presumably three of the best of 2022 and i would say that's probably accurate i i think that uh professor zardonicus if you are looking for something that's a little higher minded that's pretty good andy baker tape is really good with a slightly disappointing ending and Holes in the Sky, I think, uh, like I said, I think that's the winner of, of this group. So um, please, if you would like to drop me a line, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, you can go to legionpodcasts.com where you can find this and every episode of uh, The Dark Parade. Uh, more than that, you can also find a link to our Discord server. So drop by, uh, let me know what you thought of these movies. Um, if I look at the Discord server right now, I believe the last discussion uh, was of the Pick 6 episode and at the history of prank phone calls. So that was the discussion happening just a, a day ago. And uh, drop by. Let's talk about uh, Holes in the Sky. I want to I wanna hear your thoughts about it. Anyway, legionpodcast.com. Uh, the Discord server is uh, right there on the front page, I do believe. Uh, scroll down to the bottom. You should see all the links there to all the social media stuff. And uh, yeah, and I'll be back uh, in a week. I believe we're going to do another Heart of Horror uh, before we do another main episode, but that is coming as well. 
And uh, as always, thank you so much for joining the Dark Parade. See you next time. <laughs>